The other one, though, I would consider paying for, and I encourage you to pay for, is an aging care manager. They may also have heard of this called geriatric care manager. It's a social worker, sometimes a nurse, something like that, where they are some of you pay to go fight with the healthcare system for you and your parent. Now, insurance companies may offer you a social worker. Hospitals may also. But that social worker is there to protect the insurance company or the hospital. I'm talking about somebody you pay to be on your team to fight for you. And especially this is important if you live like in another state, you can't know what's going on, whatever. This is someone you can pay to go check in on your parents and be like, hey, how are you doing? Where are you going? Did you apply for this? Did you, you know, qualify for that? Whatever it is. And people don't think about this till it's too late. And parents often, they don't want to take monies from their kids, but they'll take the care that you pay for. What's your thoughts on aging care managers, Bree? I love them. If you, if you can get one, then parents tend to be more honest too with somebody like that versus their own kid because they don't want to worry them. Having somebody who can do these things for you and take care of your parent and who your parent trusts to tell when something needs done or is going wrong can be very helpful. Welcome to the Child Free Wealth Podcast hosted by Bree and Dr. J, Certified Financial Planner. Here we discuss life and finances as it relates to being child-free. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Please consult your advisor before implementing any ideas heard on this podcast. Hey, Child for Wealth listeners. This time we are diving deep into a topic that actually is what we call No Baby Step 7, which is caring for parents. And... It's such a big topic. Like they talk about this sandwich generation, the people taking care of their kids and their parents at the same time. Child free folks, we are the open face sandwich, I guess is what they call it. I don't know. I've heard the term. It doesn't mean I like it. But we have to take care of parents. I mean, my I've been taking care of my mother for one way or another since I was sixteen. Uh, she had her first heart attack then. Uh, it's been part of my life. But it's something that we all need a plan for. Because if we don't have a plan for caring for our parents, it can completely mess up our finances. Bree, give me your brilliant thoughts on caring for parents. And where do you start? I mean, this is a huge one. It's hard. It is very hard. And I think it all depends on not only your parent and how they respond to it, but also any health issues they've had. My parent has health issues as well. And so dealing with that has been difficult. I think anyway, the people, the parents who have health issues tend to be a bit more receptive to want to address those and have a plan in place than the ones who don't, at least in my experience. But it's, it's a hard because, because no parent wants to have a conversation with their kid about how they're going to support them. Yeah. So we, the only parents we take as clients right now on a regular basis are parents who are child-free folks. And we started like randomly offering and saying, hey, you know, sounds like your parents have a bunch of issues. How about we grab a couple of months and help them out? And often what happens is then our child-free person will pay for their parents to do this, whatever else it is. And it's been amazing to see because it just opens a conversation that says, all right, what is your plan for the future? Who's going to take care of you? Who's going to make decisions? How are we going to do this? Are you moving in with me? Are we not? Are we setting boundaries? What are we doing? And what I've found is by diving into the parent stuff, the hardest part is starting the conversation. Once the conversation started, the parents tend to be pretty good about it. It's just like that first awkward conversation. Yeah. It's like cracking through a the shell on a nut. It can be hard to get through at first. <laughs> Yeah, we'll include in the show notes. We have an article from Women's World on questions to ask your parents. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you a free tool. The free tool is Dr. J says, I need to ask you these questions. And they're going to say, who the hell is he? And that's okay. You explain he's a certified financial planner who says, I need to talk to you about this stuff. Blame me. Okay. I can be the you know reason you got to talk to him and say, we're going to run through this list. And they'll kind of humor it. Because by the way, Part of it is like, if you blame somebody else, like it's not you asking. I think the other part of it is you need to say to them, I don't care about the estate or how much money I'm getting. I'm not asking because of that. I'm asking because I want to have a plan for your care. Is that fair, Bray? Yeah. And if you say that, 
especially if your parents are already working with somebody, they may take it as a joke. I know the person my parents work with, I said that. And they're like, oh, you can just spend it all now. And I was like, no, seriously, I don't care. You, you can, that's fine. <laughs> People don't necessarily expect that to be the answer. Usually it's like, oh, what, what are they going to get from me? Yeah. And by the way, reality check for most of the people listening here, I'll bet you 75% or better. You're not getting anything. Your parents' money's going to their healthcare. You know, like they talk about this like big generational thing. The baby boomers are going to leave millions to the next generation. Nope. They're actually going to leave it to healthcare organizations because they didn't pay the bill. Yep. I'm a little jaded on that, but the reality check is health, long-term care, $108,000 a year. Women use 3.7 years on average, men 2.2 years plus everything else that Medicare doesn't cover, that's most people's inheritance. Mm -hmm. That is very true. It's just, I don't know. I'd love to say, hey, you're going to get millions from your parents. If somebody says to me, I'm going to get $2 million from my parents, I automatically take whatever number they get and cut it in half and go, yeah, that's what you get. If they have less than half a million dollars, I'm going, nah, you're going to get nothing. <laughs> you know, like just the way the numbers work. You might get something, but don't count on it. So we're not really talking about, hey, my parents are going to set me up for life. We're talking more about like, how do I make sure my parents are set for the rest of their life? And how do I not, you know, destroy my life and go away by? So the first step, and this goes before anything else, I want you to think about setting boundaries and really saying, what am I willing to do versus not? So for example, for me and my wife, nobody lives with us. We've just set the rule. Like just can't. Like, you know, and I might be able to live with my parents, my in-laws. Oh, oh wait, never mind. Oh, we're not gonna talk about in-laws. Oh, no, but like Don't everybody has in-laws. <laughs> no, no, I mean, like, it's always the in-laws, the outlaws. And by the way, keep in mind in a couple, the in-law is always the other one. Okay. Like, you know, there's always mm -hmm. yeah, it's just I couldn't do it. Other people, they could. And I also don't think I would ever live with them. You know, uh, it just kind of, I couldn't do that either. What do you think, Bree? Are you okay with, you know, all the in-laws and outlaws living with you? I don't have children living with me or have children for the reason of, I want to be left alone in my house. <laughs> so. Okay. So here's the reality. Child-free folks respect to take care of the parents because what happens is what we call the financial bingo, which is you don't have kids, so you can take care of mom. So literally, you just made the argument of why they should you should be taking care of that. No, I think out of me and my sibling, my sibling is going to be the one taking care of them. Also, my parents would never move where I live. That ain't happening. I know that right now. <laughs> but the point is to have the conversation. You know, so for example, a lot of areas have started allowing ADUs, which are accessory dwelling units, which is like a little apartment, in-law apartment is the way you should call it. So they can live there on the property. Cool. Other people say, hey, I'm going to move in with my parents. Cool. If that's what you want, that's fine. What you don't want is to be forced into it. And the reason we want to set boundaries now is because once your parents are sick, saying no to them is a lot harder. That's the thing. So, all right, Bree, so if nobody's living with you, are you willing to pay for stuff for them? Conditionally. So up to a certain amount. Up to a certain amount, and there are other things too, yeah. Okay. By the way, whatever your conditions, whatever your amount, that's fine. You know, so like, for example, I was having a conversation with somebody recently, and what I want is like a bucket of money that I'm willing to spend, but no more, no less, and under these conditions. You know, I'm willing to pay for their health care. Like, so, for example, for me, I don't, I'm not going to give cash, but I'll pay for groceries. I'll pay for health care. I'll pay for bills. I'll do that type of stuff. But I want you to have some limit, you know. If your parents run a half million dollar bill in long-term care, are you really going to pay all of it? You know, there was somebody from my book who uh, her dad uh, ended up with cancer and they decided they're just going to take care of him no matter what. And her spouse quit his job to take care of dad. And it worked out fine for him. And it's great. And it's a great sacrifice and it was a way to do it. And they said they'd do it over again. Cool. Other people can't afford that. You need to figure out what you can and cannot do for your parents. Same thing goes with time. Like, can you actually take time off of work and do it, you know, 
yes, there's family medical leave. You might be able to get access from that from work, but is it going to set you back in your career? Or are you going to be able to afford it? Like you need to make those decisions now, not when something's happening. Yeah. Cause the emotional decision will be very different from the decision beforehand. Yep. Let's run through a list, a couple different things. Talk to me, Bree, about the paperwork you want to make sure is in place for your parents. It's going to be the estate planning. And we talked about this in a previous episode, but it's the will, living will, power of attorney. Those are the three primary things to make sure they have done covered. Will determines what happens after they pass. Living will says what they want done now while they're living. And essentially, it can also be called a healthcare directive too. And so what healthcare decisions they want made with that, they're going to have a medical power of attorney. So who makes medical decisions for them? And then financial power of attorney. So who can help with their finances now? And you want to know if you are that executor or power of attorney. Like, and you want to have that conversation. So if you got siblings, you're saying, mom has decided that we are, you know, that I'm the medical power of attorney. By the way, don't be surprised if your parents split who does what. You know, like there's all different things. I'm the final answer person. You want to know that. You know, same with financial or executor. You want to have those discussions in advance. Last thing you want to be is by their bedside when they're medically having issues and having an argument over this. And here's where I will differ with some lawyers. Lawyers win because of legal battle, but I'm just going to tell you my opinion, not my legal advice. My opinion is I do not like it when a power of attorney says or, like you or your sibling. I want one of us to be the primary person and one to be the backup. Because if it's or, then we're having a debate. And like, what happens if we like tie? You know, I say pull the plug and they say not to. That's a problem. Yeah. I, yeah, from this perspective, it is. Oh, you get along with your sibling. It's fine until there's a problem. I just, I know. Thinking the ones that say and, though, are, those are much worse. Yeah, one name is good. Yeah. You also want to make sure, like in the wills and other things, if there's anything that's really important, it's outlined, you know, like who gets grandma's engagement ring or whatever, you know, like sentimental things. The money, well, change how the state's going to take a lot of it for their insurance anyway. The other thing you need to have is an in case I die file, which is like where all their accounts and passwords are. Here's the problem. If your parents are old enough, they may not have online user IDs yet. Like this becomes an issue of chasing down paper, literal paper, mail to it. You know, I'm thinking of a couple different people I've worked with and where every time we meet, we find another piece of paper with another something. Like, for example, your parents may have physical stock certificates, like actual like pieces of paper that are the stock. And if you lose that piece of paper, you got to go chase it down forever, not sitting in their Vanguard account. You know, you need to find those things. One of my favorite, my neighbor... His father died. His father was a depression heir and always had a rainy day fund of gold coins in a coffee box can. That about quarter million dollars in coins was buried. He never told the kids where. They ripped up the house, ripped up the yard, never found it. Quarter million dollars somewhere missing and someday, hopefully somebody will find it and It'll be one heck of a day, but like, these are the things you need to know what's there. What are your life insurance policies? What are your health policies? We'll come to long-term care in a second because that's a specific one, but like, you need to know where everything is. You need to have a copy of all the paperwork because you don't want to have to like go break into a safe deposit box or fly cross country to get their paperwork when something's going wrong. Anything jump out th there for you, Bree? Yeah, keep a copy on your phone because... Nothing will ever go wrong when you're in a position to easily get paperwork. Yeah. I do like also with your parents, if you can get them on a password manager so you can get shared passwords. So you can do all that and get an idea. You can also get added to their account as a trusted person. Now, trusted person is special. This is not putting your name in the account like you own it. It is someone they can call when something weird happens. So example of this, I had somebody, one of my colleagues dealt with that, Woman was like in her 80s, started dating somebody decades younger, started taking out tens of thousands of dollars out of the bank regularly. And the bank called the daughter was like, 
your mom is taking out like $20,000 this time. Um, something looks funky. And the trusted person can like pause things. So they went talk to mom and mom said, yep, I'm taking this money out and I'm giving it to my boyfriend and I don't care. Okay, well, the mom, that's mom's money. Like the trusted person can't stop it, but at least can have the conversation. One of the big scams right now and something we don't have to worry about because we're child free, but your parents might have people who have kids is the grandkids scheme, which is they somebody spoofs your grandkids cell phone number. Calls up grandma and says, I hate grandma, I'm in jail. I need $10,000 for bail. Wire it to something or another. And grandma goes and wires money to wherever to get their grandkid out of jail. It's actually so common because it works. Like, you know, I don't want to tell anyone, blah, 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 you know, all the secrecy. To the point where banks now are like, wait a minute, you've never wired money in your life. And you're all of a sudden wired into a random place. They can call the trusted person and put a hold on it. Elder abuse is a huge issue. So you want to have some visibility. And, and the time to do that is now, not when they're in cognitive decline. Very true. Because they're not going to be able to make decisions or tell you where things are. Hunting things down when they don't even know themselves is a nightmare. Yeah, I had somebody that had to follow. They knew the parent had a safe deposit box, which by the way, if you're young enough, you probably don't even know those exist. They're like literally a box you buy in the vault at the bank and you get keys for it. And they found the key, but couldn't find the bank. So they literally had to call all the local banks in the last five states the parents lived in to find out which one was it. Like, oh, what a nightmare. So like, these are the type of things we're trying to get you ahead of is by having that in case I die file and having it up to date and getting all that. If your parents... If you have issues where maybe they may not know everything that's going on, kind of decline, other things, you can actually sign up for informed delivery through the postal service. So you get a scan of their mail as it comes in. Doesn't show you the inside, but shows you the outside where you can be like, oh, they just got an IRS notice and they didn't tell me about it. Like, you know, like, hey, that's something we should talk about. You need to do that. I think at some point for most people, it's easier for you to take over their finances completely then to have them have to do it, you have to do it. You know, it's just easier to do it completely. Yeah, because if you're half of is done by the parent, half is done by you, something's going to get missed. One person do everything is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I really don't care if it's them or you or whoever, but just one person. And by the way, keep in mind, they're probably still writing physical checks. So, you know, you may have to go figure out what's going on with the system. Most definitely. <laughs> there are things here like, Really? They're do- yes, they're still doing it by hand and like literally writing on the envelope and uh, or like balancing the sending checkbook. in a check for their credit card every month. <laughs> yeah. So you may have to just help them through that. All right. So some specific things I want to make sure you check with your parents. Long-term care. And really the question is, do they have a plan for it? So let me give you the nightmare. The nightmare is, and I had some of this happen too. So sad. Mom's in the 90s and she's in the hospital for a period of time, like months during that period of time does not pay her long-term care premium. So what do they do? They got canceled. Yeah. That's and once it's favorite. canceled, forget it. You want to find out if they have a long-term care insurance policy. A lot of elderly folks actually had really good long-term care policies like that you cannot get now. Like I had somebody I uh, looked at, had quite a few people with a uh, CalPERS, which is California has uh, as part of their pension. They had a long-term care policy where they had like six year and, and unlimited year policies, which don't exist now uh, for a whole lot cheaper. Well, you as the kid might be better off paying that policy to make sure it's in place or at least get listed as a secondary contact. Like, hey, if the bill doesn't get paid, please let me know. Uh, so we do that. If on the other hand, they have no coverage. Remember, Medicare does not cover long-term care. So Medicaid becomes the issue. The problem with Medicaid is you have to have spent through all your assets to qualify. And that depends state by state. There's specific rules, but you have to have like no assets, no income to qualify. They go, well, I want to protect the house. So Medicaid doesn't take it. Well, Medicaid, what they might do is put a lien on the house, give them coverage, and then take the house after. We go, well, how would I give it away to somebody? Well, there's a five-year look back. So if they gave any stuff five years ago, or four years technically, and 
300 days, whatever it was. Medicaid say, I'm not going to cover you until that, that comes back. You know, so like they can delay it, they can charge it. It's like, it's a nightmare. And the reality check is Medicaid care is not the best. You know, I was having a debate with somebody today and they said, well, you know, if you get in a facility, when you, if you're paying out of pocket, you go to Medicaid, they'll keep you. Maybe, maybe not. But they may also move you from a private room to a room with four people in it or other care. I mean, it becomes, it becomes a big problem. What are you thinking, Bray? Yeah, knowing what their plan is and making sure they have a plan because not everybody does or even thinks about it. And I know I've had people say, oh, well, I didn't know I would have, should have done that. Thinking about that, talking through, knowing what that is is going to be really important because you don't want a surprise at the end when suddenly the stuff you've had forever has to get sold or is taken by Medicaid or you end up with a large bill. Yeah, it's a sad, okay? We've got a terrible system for caring for elderly folks and we need to improve it, but we don't really have a solution. You know, it, it's just one of those things. You need to figure out what you're willing to help with and not. Are you okay with your parents going to a Medicaid facility or are you going to pay for their long-term care out of pocket at $108,000 a year? I, per person, yeah. Yeah, it gets really expensive. The other one though, I would consider paying for and I encourage you to pay for is an aging care manager. They may also have heard of this called geriatric care manager. It's a social worker, sometimes a nurse, something like that, where they are somebody you pay to go fight with the healthcare system for you and your parent. Now, insurance companies may offer you a social worker, hospitals may also, but that social worker is there to protect the insurance company or the hospital. I'm talking about somebody you pay to be on your team to fight for you. And especially this is important if you live like in another state, you can't know what's going on, whatever. This is someone you can pay to go check in on your parents and be like, hey, how are you doing? Where are you going? Did you apply for this? Did you, you know, qualify for that? Whatever it is. And people don't think about this till it's too late. And parents often, they don't want to take monies from their kids, but they'll take the care that you pay for. What's your thoughts on aging care managers, Bree? I love them. If you, if you can get one, then parents tend to be more honest too with somebody like that versus their own kid because they don't want to worry them. Having somebody who can do these things for you and take care of your parent and who your parent trusts to tell when something needs done or is going wrong can be very helpful. Yeah. The problem with aging care managers is they're hard to find. So good ones are very hard to find because they're working. Aginglifecare.org, we'll put a link. You can actually search for people. Um, I've seen some people also get caregivers at like care.com. That's not the same as aging care managers. Just keep that in mind. Like, you know, they just specific things. The best answer is actually to find somebody who already has one and be like, can I get on the waiting list? Now, unfortunately, the waiting list is like when somebody dies, then they have a space for the next person. Yeah. But it does matter. Um, and the aging care manager, you might have to try out a couple people on that, like to find the right thing. You need somebody who could both tell you and your parents, hey, stop it. Do this. Yeah. Like, you know, you need, need somebody who can smack you upside the head and go, yep, that is silly. Stop doing that. Because especially when it comes to caring for family members, you need somebody that can, can say to you, you know what? You're burnt out. Go get somebody else to help. Mm -hmm. Now. Keep in mind also, when you talk about caring for parents, you may have to care for other family members too. So I've had a few of these where like, hey, I, you know, I'm going to be expected to take care of my special needs sibling when my parents pass. That is a whole different issue, but something you just some good boundaries around. You know, I, I originally called this caring for family members. The parents are kind of like the most obvious and then there's others. I think the hard part is it's okay to say no, and that's not what most people are used to. You're expected to just do it without complaint, but that doesn't have to be true. Yeah. I mean, you're not evil if you decide, hey, I cannot care for my family member, my parent, my whatever. It is what it is. Saying no when you know you can't do that and do it ineffectively is one of the kindest things you could ever do for somebody. Yeah, and say, say it now, not like when they're hurt. Yep. You know, you can get them enrolled in state programs to help. You can get people to care for them. You can do whatever. But you need to be okay saying, this is what I will do and this is what I won't. 
you know, and, and I'm not perfect at this. I'm so I'm like, I'm not saying I've, I've cracked this nut, but because my mother's been sick for most of our life, my wife, my sister and I have like a structure that we just take turns. We know who does what my wife, on the other hand, is not used to her parents being sick. So it's very weird to handle it. You know, like my sister, and I, my mother will go to the hospital. We'll call each other. Like, is it serious? No. All right. You know, we're like, yep, I'll be right there. You know, like we have a whole conversation. But then my wife will be like, your mom's in the hospital. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, just, it's Thursday. You know, like it happens. It's like, it's, and she's like, she's like, oh, what? You know, it's just a different perspective. You know, it, it, and I think it's one of those things where you're not going to know it until you get in the middle of it, what you can and can't handle. But you need to have those conversations early. And by the way, it's okay if there's different rules for different sets of parents. That sounds really weird, but like the, there can be different sets of rules, different sets of boundaries, different sets of structures. But you need to have those conversations when it's not an emergency. True. Sure. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving a rating or review. We'd love to keep the conversation going. Follow Child Free Wealth on social media or email us at podcast at childfreewealth.com. If you're interested in working together, book a free consultation call by visiting our website, childfreewealth.com. We'll see you next week.